Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Addiction. I am Al Richards, your host, and we want to say thank you to Matter Behavioral, who is our platinum sponsor. If you guys are looking for a different and a unique recovery center, we highly recommend Matter Behavioral. They, they have a way of getting inside the person and um, digging out those scars and the trauma and everything that usually creates the addiction. Um, they have a way of getting that out and they just do phenomenal work. So if you guys are looking for somebody different, again, Matter Behavioral out of Mount Pleasant, Utah, give them a call 435-462-2781. And uh, gosh, I am grateful to have Mel Hobbs in the studio with us today. Mel, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, Mel, um, Mel and I met quite a few years ago, I guess, at a networking group. And yeah. now that networking is going again, we we ran into one another at another networking yeah. group. And so, um, yeah, I was asking her if she'd like to be a guest and she was all over it. So thank you. Definitely. Thanks. Absolutely. Hey, we have a very special guest for you today. We have Nikki Patrick. Nikki, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. Yes, and thank you so much for inviting me onto the show so that I can share my experience, strength, and hope with you guys and and your listeners. That's well, really it. Yeah, thank thank you. And and I just want to say it on the air here too. Thank you to Anna Maydanova, who is now um oh my gosh, I how come I, I forgot e um <laughs> Laban's last name, Ditchburn. 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 So now it's yes. Anna Main to Nova Ditchburn. Is that what it is? But yes. anyway, Beautiful. Anna, thank you so much for introducing us. Um, Nikki and I had a great conversation back in April on a Zoom call. Gosh, I think we chatted for almost an hour. We did, yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, just so you guys know, Nikki is a certified hypnotherapist. She is also a Reiki master and a sound healing practitioner. And I'd like you, when you get a chance, to talk a little bit about the sound healing pr practitioner, because I'm still not quite 100% sure what that is. And I'd like our listeners to know a little bit more. Do you know what it is, Mel? Oh, all about it. When I was telling you about how I got into the podcast and things like that, yeah. the frequency therapy is something that I looked to every day okay. for that calmness in the storm. I know what I think I know what you're meaning now. Okay. okay. So Nikki, man, tell us a little bit more about yourself, if you would, please. All right. So you, I am a certified hypnotherapist, a Reiki master, and a sound healing practitioner. And I have, I've been, um, Reiki was the first like energy healing modality that I got into. And um, then it's kind of morphed into these other, these other two modalities. Um, but really, I had become tired of the medical system um, telling me that there was nothing wrong with me, that, um, you know, uh, it just it could, there couldn't be nothing wrong. You know what I mean? And I, and I, so I felt very discouraged. I had been mismedicated for years and misdiagnosed and, um, you know, just really, um, lost in the medical system, uh, and what was going on with me. I had a, a, a whole slew of physical symptoms. I didn't know why, um, for the most part, I'm fairly healthy, but I was in, I'm in a lot of physical pain. I was dealing with a lot of emotional pain, a lot of, um, behaviors that I didn't know how to change. I didn't know, um, I didn't, I wasn't even aware, you know, how to begin to heal these things. And I had been in traditional therapy um, and, and with uh, a therapist and a psychiatrist and all of that for a number of years. I think, um, you know, 20, well, actually, I was 14 years old when I got put on my first uh, psych med. 14? And 14, yeah. Wow. Um, and I was put on a drug called Elevil, a mood stabilizer, I guess, uh, something of the sort like that. And it did not, it did not do well with me. 
Um, and so I'll just back up real quick because I don't, the, the story begins much farther back um, for me. Uh, I was born it, to uh, a couple that was young. My mom was 18. My dad was like 21. He was just getting out of the military. She was trying to get away from her abusive, narcissistic family. And he was an escape, you know. Um, she wasn't probably ready, but that's, you know, that's what you did back in the day. You know, you you went off and you got married. Yeah. Well, um, you know, there was a lot of fighting, arguing, um, tumultuous uh, events happening in the home. Um, I have a little brother that's two years younger than me. And so we were constantly being exposed to fighting, arguing, violence, um, you know, as, as well as that violence being taken out on us, um, physically being abused. Um, and so my mother, you know, she, presented as bipolar um, with her symptoms and not being able to manage uh, her mood and get, you know, even and, and right. And my father, um, he was pretty, from what I understand, he was pretty normal. And I think that, you know, he didn't just didn't understand my mom's mental illness. Now, looking back, knowing all the things that I know now, I realized that my mom was a victim of trauma and that she did the best she could with what she had um, based on the, the tools that she was given, you know? And she was not given many. Um, her mother and father were both alcoholics. So it's like generational, you know, these yeah. alcoholic family, um, very uh, much narcissistic, uh, very much steeped in like um, religious beliefs. So there was a lot of even religious child maltreatment, like punishments in the name of God, things like that, going, being made to go to church every time there was church and um, just uh, everything being made about um, sin, fire and brimstone, you know, uh, being taught like right out of the gate that um, unworthy, we're unworthy and we have to do something for our salvation you know what i mean and yeah. so it's very very some very dark programming for a child to have to experience at a very young age a lot of anger there was a lot of um uh just my mom was a very angry woman and so that that marriage didn't last long they divorced when i was five and my brother was three and you know she we went with her and um, my father got us every other weekend according to the divorce degree and you know he just really wasn't very much more involved than that but my mother didn't make that easy either you know and so growing up I moved um, every year I went to a different school sometimes I went to two um, there was no stability uh, there it would be you know, come home from school and there's an eviction notice on the door or the electrics turned off or something like that. There was just no security or safety. And, and coupled with that, the stress that I guess my mom was under, she really jumped from relationship to relationship to relationship um, because in, in her mind, she believed that she was not, um, she was not valid unless she had a man, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and that whole, um, mentality of uh, needing a man to validate you, needing a partner, you know, uh, to make you whole. Uh, she really did believe that. And so she ended up being married a total of five times. Um, so they didn't, some lasted for years and some lasted like her shortest was six months, you know. Hmm. Um, she was a singer. Uh, she really did like to have fun and, and everything like that. But she was a uh, she was a singer. She really, um, she tried to, I remember her trying to make them the best out of our situations, even though it was crap, it was crappy. It was, you know, not fun. And some of the, she really tried to make the best of it, which I got to learn at least how to see the, the good in things and just kind of find the silver lining and that, um, being poor and broke and, and all of those things, you could still find joy, which 
I really thank her for that. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that I could say horrible about my mom um, and they would all be true. But, you know, I, I, I do want to say that there was times where she, she did her best to make it kind of something you could deal with, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But her choices were really dysfunctional. She, you know, her, her perspective, very skewed, very negative, very, um, just looking back at it now, I can see, you know, I can see all the dysfunction and how it played out, but then, you know, I just went along with it. And so here's this woman who's like, it's the late seventies. She's got two young kids. She's a single mom and she's got to make money. So we would go with her when she would sing at, you know, do her little local band gigs. And so here, my brother and I were in the front row, you know, at 11, 12 o'clock at night until one in the morning, you know, out with the band, um, watching the music being played and stuff like that. And so you can kind of like imagine that kind of life, like this was our normal, this kind of chaotic, you know, every day is a new adventure, nothing's planned, there's no kind of stability, you know, at all, like we just, that was our normal. So, you know, growing up, I reflected that in my choices as well. And so it really, it really started to, um, she gave that life up. And at the age of, I think I was like seven or eight years old when she turned her life over to the Lord and became um, a Pentecostal Christian. And that is when a lot of, still, she had a lot of distortion, a lot of, you know, um, just really skewed perspectives about God and about um, the God view. You know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the levels of consciousness um, or any of David R. Hawkins work, but he has mapped out the scale of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so um, when you have a God view that is um, through the lens of anger or judgment or these lower level consciousness, uh, even apathy and guilt and shame, then you're going to project a God that is a punishing God that is a, you know, that um, punishes you for your sins and stuff like that, you know, or that is vengeful or that is um, not all loving, which is what God is, you know what I mean? Right. So um, she married her third, the second husband was the one that lasted six months and he was like this big time drug dealer. So we were really exposed to like the party life, you know, the, up on, they were, you know, they would be up all night long partying and we'd have to be in our room just right next door, listening to all that going on. And so it was, that was the behavior modeled for us. Um, the next husband uh, fell in line with the strict Christian fundamental uh, lifestyle. And he was very abusive. He was very um, cruel. I mean, just say no to say no, you know what I mean? Like they would line us up and, and beat us, spank us. Oh, we had a rod, they had a, we had a, like a wooden paddle and it had literally had a little girl painted on it that said, and it said, spare the rod, spoil the child. And this is what we got punished with. Um, so like right there, the scripture on the, uh, on the device they used to beat us with. And so my mother in this same you know, same reference, she thought, oh, I can help other people, you know, she really, it, it was so sick and twisted, but in her mind, she was doing good, you know, Yeah. and so that was her belief, was that she was following, you know, the Lord, and what the Lord wanted, and this was, this was that, and so she took in other troubled kids, and so it was not just me and my brother, it now had become my stepfather's son, who was two years older than me, um, then it became another girl who used to babysit for us. And her mother decided at 14 years old that she was old enough to pretty much take care of herself and move to Maine. The, and, you know, her, she didn't want to go. So she asked my mom, could she live with us? And then through the church that we were a part of, she, um, started taking in other troubled kids until we had 11 kids living with us at one holy, time. There was 11 cow. of us. Yes in a three bedroom house. And 
the three girls, uh, it was three girls and the rest were boys. Um, they all shared a room and had bunk beds and we all shared a room and it was like really, you know, crazy. And we even took in this, oh God, love them. This uh, brought two brothers. One was two or four, one was four. And the other one was four days old when we got him. His mother oh, had gone God. to prison and she had him in prison. And so we got these, this brothers, these two brothers. And so at 10, I was 10 at this time. And so um, it was my job to get up for midnight feedings, for taking care of the baby. Um, we had a chore list, it was all mapped out. Uh, so by the time I was 10, I was cooking full meals for the family, caring for this infant baby, um, along with my brothers and sisters that were in the house. Like we were all doing this, you know, the, all the household chores while my mom worked and thank God my stepfather was a trucker and he was gone for the week. He would only be home on the weekends. So thank God for that, you know, yeah. that reprieve there because, you know, he was just such a cruel man. And um, so, so you were, you were a mom basically at 10 years old. Yeah. Jeez yes. almighty. Yes. And uh, it was, it was a wild experience. Um, and Man, I got to tell you, I just, I think back to those times, I don't know, I, like there was times where we ate the same thing every night just because we couldn't afford to buy any other kind of food, you know what I mean? I, it was just crazy. Uh, hand me down clothes, yard sale clothes, whatever we could. We were on, we were the one that got the gift from, you know, when you donate the the angel gift at Christmas, yeah. we were the family that received the my the family gift. was the same. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. The Christmas mother is what we called it in Virginia. The Christmas mother. Hmm. I love that. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so uh, because we moved a lot um, and I went to a different school almost every year, I didn't really have a friend base either. Uh, so I was made fun of and bullied a lot in school because I did wear hand-me-down clothes. You could tell I was poor, you know, um, and kids can be cruel. Um, so I really wanted to fit in more than anything, man. I wanted to belong somewhere that love and belonging, that need to fit in somewhere in the, in, in society, you know, and I just didn't feel like I fit anywhere. And, um, so things kept getting worse at home. Uh, the The relationship between my mother and my stepfather was vo volatile. And every day she yelled and screamed. There was no, there was so since when there's no safe place for a child, right? Um, they can't, they don't have the brain capacity to focus on learning. And yeah. so here I am in school having to get good grades or I was gonna get beat when I got home, but, I would miss school because so much craziness was going on, you know, and we wouldn't make it a day or whatever. So I'd miss a lesson. And I remember in the fourth grade, I missed, I missed zero times zero, zero times anything equals zero, right? I missed that yeah. lesson. So when it came time to take the test for that lesson, I, I didn't ask. I didn't ask what, you know, I was too embarrassed to ask for help. And so I was the only one in the whole class that had a star missing in the place, you know, cause they, every time we took a test, you got a star and next to your name. And I was the only one with no star for zero times anything, you know, and they made fun of me for that. Um, I was already trying to forge my mom's name on things that, you know, cause they would send home the bad grade, right? They'd send home the bad grade and I'd have to get it signed. I'm going to get beat. So what do I do? I forge my mom's name, got caught for that. You know what I mean? Like, it was just so much, I learned how to survive. Like I literally lived in survival mode, um, my entire life. I don't know, didn't know what it was like to even like things or like, um, what do I want to say? Like, what did I like? What did I want to be? What did yeah. I create in life? You couldn't, you couldn't even be a kid. I mean, it no. sounds like you didn't even have an opportunity because <clears throat> kids have a huge imagination. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you didn't even have time to, to even think about that because you were so busy with all the other chaotic mess that was happening around your life. Yes. Yes. And so 
some of the like some of the benefits are that is it's really easy for me to read a room. You know, it's kind of like I know how to navigate through different situations and kind of fit in and and I can talk like because I went to so many different schools, I I can make friends really easy. It's not hard for me to go talk to people. You know, I'm not afraid of those things. So it did have some of its benefits. I'm very, you know, I was I could take care of myself. I don't worry about, you know, that it was kind of like I became fearless because I had already been through so much. I'd already experienced so much of the world. So when my, when my mom finally left that guy and there was some traumatic stuff, like there was some real, like she would, so before I, I go into the next segment, I just got to share this because this was like one of the craziest punishments I've ever been a part of. Um, But she had this thing, this little wicker angel and it sat on a mantle, right? It was just a, mantle piece nothing major it was wicker it's an angel and she had us all sit down at the table and write down um the worst punishment we could think of and fold it up on this piece of paper and she said and do it right because if you don't i'll know i'll know if you don't write a good enough punishment and you'll get in trouble and so we put it in this angel and it was called the angel of death and my stepbrother got in trouble for something and had to pick from this angel And so he picked what I wrote down and I wrote down, because this was the worst punishment I could think of, 10 whacks with that paddle from each child. And so we each took turns having to beat him. Oh, Oh, holy cow. And uh, he couldn't go to school because he was so bruised. And I thought in in my mind, I was like, well, let me hit him lower because I know his ass probably hurts by now. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. And so then um, I got in trouble because he had bruises that were showing below where his shorts would have marked. He couldn't sit down anyway for a week. He had to lay face down on the couch for a week after that. And so I got in trouble for leaving the marks on the lower part of the legs. And with the kids, they were like, who wrote that punishment? And I was like, well, I did. Why would you write anything like that? And I was like, "I I don't know. You know, I was following the rules. And so they were against me because I had, you know, written that out. And so it was the, I I don't even like, (laughs) I I just want to hug you right now. (laughs) (laughs) No kidding. Jeez. Thank you. (laughs) Because when you think about it, you know, I mean, God, who thinks of shit like that, you know? Yeah, no kidding. For children to do. Um, those are the, the people that you look to for protection, because that's all you had. And then to be turned into a weapon like that, that's too much. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, there were other incidences where I was, um, blamed for things. Um, you know, my stepfather, we moved into this house, uh, And the woman that let us live there was the grandmother of the two young boys whose daughter was in prison. And she had a cat and she was like, take care of my cat, you know, and my stepfather was so mean to cats and I loved cats. I still love cats. I got four cats. And so um, he would throw this cat, the cat would get on the counter. She let the cat, you know, the cat was being the cat, you know, and he'd throw this cat and So months had gone by, like a year goes by, you know, and the cat now is skittish. It barely comes out. It does, you know, and the lady comes, you know, over and she sees the state of the cat and she's like, what the hell, you know, what did you guys do to my cat? So I told on my stepdad and she kicked us out and I got blamed for that. So as we're driving to the next place, you know, I'm getting how I am unloyal I'm not, you know, not loyal to this family, Uh, you know, all this crazy mind fuckery. Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Wait a minute. I got to write that, that word down. (laughs) (laughs) All All right. right. That's what it is though. I got it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It was a whole lot of like gaslighting and uh, I just had no concept of a of what a boundary was <laughs> um or or like even being allowed to have that or uh 
an identity of self. You know, I did not, I was everything what everybody wanted me to be because I felt like being me wasn't good enough, you know? Um, so finally, my mom leaves this guy. Uh, I was 13 years old and she left him. And so it's now, and all the kids dispersed, you know, they all went back to their families and, um, uh, the stepson of my stepfather, he turns out he was touching little boys and molesting little boys. And he even had, uh, we didn't find this out until years, years later, but had, um, violated my brother. Um, and so that was all crazy. Um, and so it was very, it ended very dramatically, you know, the church didn't even want us like in there anymore so we got kicked out of the church so now even like this place where i saw god as you know our place of refuge our place of community our sense of belonging we were now no longer welcome there your one safe place at that point yeah 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 the one safe place at that point we're no longer welcome there so i really at that point turned my back on on god on on everything you know um i did not care anymore and i Um, I remember I was 13 when I got my first job. I washed dishes. I got paid under the table. And um, we lived out in Indiana. So when I say we moved, like we didn't just move like around Maryland where I'm from. We moved like to Tennessee, to Indiana, Delaware. We like, we we changed states. Um, Yeah. So it was really a lot of like, we're going to pick up and just go, you know? Um, So Coming back from that, I remember getting my first job. That's right, getting my first job right before we moved back to to our hometown here in Maryland. Um, I'm 13, and I had been really like just uh, made fun of and teased so much in school. Like I really wanted to fit in, so I I dyed my hair. I you know I was like a totally different. I remade myself, you know, and um, and I remember coming back and I started to hang out with um, the type of people that get high. Um, I remember my 14th birthday was the first time I ever smoked weed. And my, the, I babysat for this woman. She was a bartender where I also washed the dishes. And um, I babysat for her and uh, she was like, hey, it's your birthday. You want to smoke a joint? So I was like, yeah. Um, and that was wild. Like I was just on the floor, I think just stuck like motion sick, but not moving. Like I'm on the floor, literally like glued to it. I was like, oh my God, I don't even know why I kept doing that. But like, she was also like, (laughs) like a month later, she was like, Hey, do you want to try a line of Coke? And then, you know, a little while later, she was like, you want to try this line of crank, you know? And so this is how I, my first drug experiences. So when we go back to, to Maryland now, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I do all this stuff. Yeah. You You've grown I mean? up, right? I've grown up. <laughs> I'm grown <Yeah>. up. <laughs> I got a job. I was helping my mom pay bills cause, and, and it wasn't on my, it wasn't on my terms. It wasn't like, I was like, here, mom, let me help you. She was like, no, give me that paycheck, you know? Um, so it was crazy. And in school, having to go through all of this and pay attention and learn, man, I cheated my way through a lot of school. Yes. Survival tactics, man. Right. It's what you got to do to survive. Um, and so of course my mom has to jump to another guy. So her fourth husband is, uh, this next guy who's like 11 years younger than her. And he's like party dude. So now she's all wrapped up in him. I'm 14, got a job, got my own money, you know, even though she's taken most of it still didn't matter, you know, and I started to do whatever I wanted. I started having sex. I started doing drugs. I started drinking, um, I just did whatever I wanted to do. I didn't listen. Nobody could tell me nothing. And, um, I continued in that. And that's when I kind of like started to spiral out of control. Cause you know, when you're doing all those drugs, you're 
mind isn't going to stay, you know, I've ex here I've up till this point, I've experienced all this trauma, no therapy, no kind of intervention or help, not even um, direction, no direction at all. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. And I think about this and I'm like, how many kids out here were like me? You know, how many people, how many children are out here right now just totally being neglected, you know? And um, which is why I like really am inspired to do the work that I do now, even though I don't directly deal with children, I'm more like, all right, I'll help them once they're grown and they're away <laughs> from that. Yeah. Now, I'll help you deal with your trauma, you know, as adult. Um, now it's just, it's crazy because, um, growing up, I did not, uh, having those experience with the children, you know, um, all those kids, I didn't want kids. And, um, so anyway, I, I didn't even like kids cause I wasn't liked as a kid, you know, that's the model. That's the behavior that was modeled to me. If you, if, if an adult is always like bothered by you, like, oh, what do you want now? You know, it's that tone, man. It's that, you know, I felt like a bother, um, the lack of attention. So I did whatever I could to get attention, whether it was good or bad, you know? Um, so there was like these, a multiple yeah. multitude of dysfunctional things. And again, like once again, this new boyfriend my mom was with, he was a crackhead and an alcoholic. So here we go again, having to move because he's done ripped off the dope man, you know? So we had to leave the state. And so we picked up and at 15, well, yeah, it was like 15, we go to Tennessee. And I just want to back that up and say 14, I did start seeing a psychiatrist and that's when they put me on that mood stabilizer. It didn't do well. And I tried to take all of it. And so they put me into the first mental institution that I was in. And, um, I got out and I was in recovery. Then that was my first introduction. Um, no, I got out and then I ended up going to rehab because I was doing literally like more LSD than the Grateful Dead. I don't know. I was doing a lot. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Lots of Lucy in the sky with diamonds, yes. huh? <laughs> yes, absolutely. That was my escape, man. Talk about shifting realities, you know. Like if you, if, if that was why, how I was escaping was through, you know, wow. either doing acid or getting blackout drunk, you know? Um, so of course, wherever you go, you take you with you. So I took myself to Tennessee um, and I still acted out in the same way. Um, still just promiscuous behavior, wanting to get this love and belonging from anybody who would give it to me being whatever anybody else wanted me to be, you know, conforming to that in order to be able to fit in and be accepted. And so the, of course, my stepdad, he, she married the guy, she married the four, number four and, um, it got so bad. Like his addiction got so bad that he was taking our rent money, our food money, our like, and going out and buying crack and he crashed the car and had to be life flighted and like, total opened up down the middle and like craziness. And we were like, mom, my brother and I were like, mom, you can't take this guy back. He's not going to change, you know? And so she is like, all right, I won't, I promise. And what does she do? She took him back, you know? Yeah. That's not, what so, we do. <laughs> not, <laughs> yes, it is. it is. Not, not wanting to be alone again. You know, yes. yeah, I can get it. <clears throat> be, <clears throat> before we move on, Nikki, um, can we take a, sh a short break here, yeah. short commercial break? And then let's come back where you were just finishing up here saying that your yeah. mom ended up taking, taking him back after this surgery. So, okay. so guys stay with us. We'll be, we'll be right back. Do you or a loved one or someone, you know, struggle with addiction? Have you lost hope or are you struggling to make connections? Have you been to other treatment programs and have yet to reach your full potential? We, we are Matter, Matter Behavioral, Behavioral Health. Health. At Matter Behavioral Health, we understand substance abuse treatment works best when the client is taught ways of identifying for themselves their own dysfunctional views of their life that trigger their self-limiting beliefs and leads back to addiction. We help you get to the core of what's causing your addiction. 
We offer inpatient and outpatient services. To find out what's best for you, call us at 435-462-2781. That's 435-462-2781. Don't wait. Give us a call. Your life depends on it. Call us at 435-462-2781. Have you ever been in a car accident? Do you know what to do after being in a car accident? Are the insurance companies going to take care of you? Hi, I'm attorney Rick Heaton with the law office of Bobby Udall. I will help you through the process and answer all of these questions. I give every single client my cell phone so they can talk to me whenever they need. Let me deal with the insurance company so you can focus on getting better from your injuries. Call me at 385-330-0226. Again, my cell phone number. 385-330-0226. Don't call the insurance company first. Call attorney Rick Heaton at 385-330-0226. Hello, my friends. This is Brad Newfeld, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Resilience Talk Network. You can listen to my show, Resilience, every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. On my show, we will be discussing what it takes for you to overcome the day-to-day -day challenges that all of us face in life, as well as some of the devastating ones that may lead us to feelings of hopelessness and despair. It's my goal to provide you with the tools and skills that you need to overcome anything that is thrown your way. To find out more about my show, visit our website at www.resiliencetalk.com. That's www.resiliencetalk.com. And as always, until we meet again, go for everything that you want in life and make it happen. Welcome back to the other side of addiction. Again, we want to say thank you to our platinum sponsor, Matter Behavioral at a Mount Pleasant. If you guys are looking for a different and unique way of recovering from whatever it is that you are battling, get a hold of our friends at Matter Behavioral Health at 435-462-2781. And uh, we have uh, Mel Hobbs joining us today as the guest co-host. Mel, again, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. And with our very special guest, Nikki Patrick. Nikki, again, gosh, the first half of the show is, is it was just phenomenal. And we want to get right back where you were letting off. So you said that your stepfather wrecked the car. He had to be opened up. Um, you and your brother are saying, Mom, don't take him back. And what does she do? Promises. Yep, she takes him back. Yes. So, all right. We had, um, at this point in time, I'm 16 and my brother is 14. Um, so I was driving, um, working, you know, going to school. Uh, actually, the one good thing I can say, of it, I wanted to quit school. And you know, when you're 16, you can like legally quit. But she would not let me. And I'm so grateful for that. She made me stick school out. And, you know, like I said, like, there were times where she was okay, you know. Um, but you could never trust her. You could never trust her, um, you know, when you want to confide in that, you know, your mom, you know what I mean? And she would just always turn around and use it against you. But okay, so um, in that, uh, that was, this was back in the day, this was 1991. Okay, so in, um, I had a boyfriend and he didn't live close, you know, and uh, so we were always be on the phone and of course, long distance charges and stuff like that. And um, we wrote each other letters, you know, in the mail. <laughs> um, Did you spray it with perfume? I remember yeah, girlfriend yeah, spray it with oh perfume. Gosh, I totally forgot about <laughs> that. little pictures. Yeah. And all that, you know, <laughs> so um, I remember 
my mom and so we had a couple of other guys. We always had somebody living on the couch, you know what I mean? And so we had a couple, one, uh, two, two of the guys that um, knew us from Maryland were good friends came with us to Tennessee, you know? And uh, so they were there, my stepdad, my mom and my brother. So my brother was upstairs playing video games and um, he had just gotten back from a cross country trip with my grandparents to Alaska. My brother was the golden child, like he could do no wrong. I was always the one that got in trouble, the black sheep, the problem child, you know. Um, he was just better at hiding it. That's all it was. He learned, he learned well from me. He did. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's so, my daughter. <laughs> right. <laughs> she learns from her brother's mistakes. <laughs> yeah. So he got to watch me make all the mistakes. And so that's how he learned. Um, so anyway, they, so that's how come they did something with him and not me. You know what I mean? Like they took him on the trip to Alaska. I didn't want to go anyway. Let's be honest. Who wants to hang out with your grandparents all summer long when you could, when you have a car and you, you know, you can do whatever the hell you want. So yeah. I am in this, you know, I'm coming, I come home and um, the stepdad is there and I'm like shocked. So I'm like, what's going on? You know, he's here. Why is he here? Well, she gets pissed because, of course, she doesn't tell him the conversation that we had, you know, uh, that she wasn't going to take him back. So I was like, you know, you said you weren't going to take him back, you know, and mm -hmm. we told you that if you did take him back, we were leaving. So this is me telling you that I'm leaving. And um, she got really pissed at that. And so she had been going through the mail and one of the, the letter came from my my boyfriend and she opens it trying to embarrass me in front of everybody and reads it like really sarcastically oh, and so I snatch it out of her hands you know and so she she hits me and she she grabs this like dowel rod that you hang like a picture up with right it's wooden it's like it's not real thick yeah but she like hits me on my thigh with it like twice and she goes to hit me the third time and I stop her and I wailed on this woman and I took out 16 years of frustration and I beat the shit out of my mother that day. And Holy cow. yeah, like I was done. I was like, I am done. And she, I think she was like the guys, they just did nothing. They sat on the yeah. couch, like in shock that this was happening right in front of them. Nobody got involved. Everybody just let us fight and so finally um you know she's yelling and screaming I'm not leaving and I'm like yes I am I'm done and uh my brother comes downstairs with a baseball bat and he looks at her and he says if you hit her one more time I'll kill you to your mom to, or you to my mom okay wow. like, Wait a second. That, yeah he was done too you know and um so he's like, yeah, if you hit her one more time, I'll kill you. And it, it kind of, she stopped and she was just like, what, like, you know, what the fuck have I done? Kind of, Yeah, no because, kidding. you know, he was her favorite. He's the, you know, golden child here telling her, you know, he's had enough too. So we told my grandparents what happened and they took us home that weekend. And so I left when I was 16. And my brother was 14 and we went, came back here to Maryland. And so things began to get better. My grandparents, they were old now, so they weren't as dysfunctional as they used to be, but still dysfunctional. You know, my grandmother was very much like uh, mommy dearest, you know, like the mind fuckery type stuff. Mm, and wow. She didn't have a lot of energy to beat anybody anymore, you know, like she used to, I'm sure when because I've heard all kinds of stories. My mom is one of five children and that grew up on the hog and chicken farm, um, which I also had to work as a child too, like getting up before school at 4.30 in the morning and cleaning out chicken houses. Now these are chicken houses with 20,000 chickens in each house, you know? Well, so, I, I had to clean a chicken house too, but we only had like 20 chickens and I, <laughs> it was terrible just with 20. So I, I, I can even yeah. still smell it. 
Yes, it's a horrible smell. And to get oh, up gosh. before school and you would go and you have to pick up these dead chickens that have died because they're overcrowded in there. And then you have to kill the diseased chickens. So I'm like killing chickens first thing in the morning. This is before school. <laughs> and we take the chickens, put them in a wheelbarrow and dump them over to the hogs. Like this was, you know, 4 30 hmm. in the morning so i'm going to school smelling like chicken shit and hog you know what i mean yeah and hog crap and hog crap yeah so now you know i get made fun of for that i remember being in the third grade and you know we're supposed to do creative writing so i wrote you know whatever and my teacher read people's papers out loud she didn't say whose name it was but when she got to mine she read mine and it had a lot of mistakes of punctuation, grammatical misspelling mistakes. And she emphasized every mistake and the kids would laugh. And she, did, you know, at, through the whole, it was horrible. It was horrible. Why the hell would a teacher even do that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like, so like I had experienced a lot of public humiliation um, at a young age. Yeah. Being made fun of in school and, and stuff like that. It was crazy. But I couldn't go home and be like, you know, I would go home and be like, mom, they made fun of me at school. And she'd be like, suck it up. You know, yeah, it's a dog eat dog world. Don't let anybody eat your dog. You know what I mean? Like she'd say the craziest shit to me. But um, we moved back here and we left my mom there. She stayed with him for like a few more years, like four, maybe three more years before she finally had enough and left. And um, by that time, I was, maybe she stayed, yeah, she stayed like two more years because um, I was 17, I was 17 and I was dating a guy I really thought I loved. He was a great guy. He was a nice guy. And I ended up getting pregnant at the beginning of my senior year. So I was in like 10th grade and now I'm a senior. So it's somewhere like that, right? And she had just left him and was living with my, her older sister, sleeping on her couch, getting her life together, whatever, you know, going to AA, she had started to change. Mm -hmm. And so um, she was in, not in any position to help me with being pregnant, you know, and he, the father wanted to have the baby and us have a family. And I was like, hell no. No, I just, you know, got free. I'm like about to be free. I'm about to be 18. You know what I mean? It was like a few months away. <laughs> it was like, no, I want to go to college. I want to live life. I want to be free of all of this stuff, you know? And so I chose to put the baby up for adoption. And so my, my grandparents were like, you can't live here. And I was an abomination and another one of their, you know, because most of the daughters got pregnant before they were married. So of course, here I am continuing yeah. the trend. Okay. And so they were going to put me in a home in Baltimore for girls who get pregnant and put their babies up for adoption. And so that was going to be a permanent, like not permanent. It was a permanent adoption, but a closed adoption, meaning there'd be no contact between me and the child. And I so didn't you, want that. Yeah. So you'd have yeah. no idea who took your yeah. child. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. And I didn't want that. So my other aunt, my mom's young, little, um, she's got a sister that's like a little over a year after her. They're, they call them Irish twins or something. I'm an Irish but, twin. Um, yeah. We were yeah. just talking about that before the yeah. show. <laughs> Huh. And, um, she stepped in and she actually lived in Costa Rica with her husband and her three boys. Um, and at the time we did not know it, but he was in the CIA. Um, but he had some cover job at the time and we always had our like suspicions, but nobody really knew what uncle Charlie did, you know? Um, so she said, do you want to come live with us and we'll help you put the baby up for adoption? And I was like, Yeah. So I did that and I got to go live in Costa Rica, um, which was a great experience. I got to see a third world country and kind of really realize how good I had it here in the United States, you know, yeah. um, it was an eye opener. I think I went through like a month and a half of culture shock, just the way people lived, you know, and the difference, the dichotomy, um, in, it was just wild, but, um, when I, so the, a fam, the family that adopted my son, 
okay, let me back up, sorry. The lawyer that handled the adoption was my uncle Charlie's cousin. She was a lawyer. And so she found a family. And so I kind of got to be a part of the process of picking the family. So she um, had, you know, brought me a few choices. She was like, okay, these people live in the city, blah, blah, blah. They're like this, this, and this. And these people live in, they have a farm. They have like 20, I think it was like 20,000 acres in Iowa, you know, Mm -hmm. and then these people over here. And so I picked the farm people because I grew up on a farm and I wanted, you know, my kid to have that love of nature and gardening and animals and things like that, that I had, you know, that self-sufficient, I can do it. Cause when you live on a farm, you work a farm, you know, as soon as you can start working. And I had a very good work ethic that, I mean, to the, to the point of like, I always would go get a job, you know, I might not be able to keep that job because I didn't have you know, some other skills that you need (laughs) to hold down a job, (laughs) but I wasn't afraid to go work. You know, I wasn't afraid to hustle. And so, um, I said, okay, well, I'm going to, I picked that family and they had been trying for years to have a baby. Um, and she just couldn't, they tried in vitro and everything. And so I was their first opportunity to be able to have a child. And, um, that was, it was, now looking back, it was the best thing I could have ever done for, for him, you know, the best thing I could have ever done. Um, but at the time I felt like a failure as a woman, as a mother, as a, you know, just a failure all the way around. So I really, uh, they wanted me to go into the military and I was like, okay, but I didn't want to, you know, like, um, I really was scared of that. Like I, I, I grew up with somebody yelling and screaming at me. You'd think I'd be used to it, but I did not want to go and be yelled and screamed at, you know what I mean? By a a drill sergeant. And although that discipline now looking back at it would have probably been great. My college would have been paid for, but anyway, (laughs) um, I was like, no. So there was something medically, um, wrong in the female department that I wasn't supposed to tell or I would have been disqualified. So I told that was like my last. And I had, yeah, I was like, get me out of here. But I couldn't tell them no, because you know, yeah. I was a pleaser, you know what I mean? Um and I remember I scored so high on the ASVAB I could pick whatever job I wanted. I don't even know how I did it. Like I don't even know how I scored that high, but um I guess I guessed right. Yeah. <laughs> I guessed right. Well, you have a 50 50 chance of answering you do, it, right? right? You know, yeah. Like, um, he was like, these are some of the highest scores in electronics and, and mechanics I've ever seen. And I was like, oh, my dad's a mechanic. <laughs> I don't know. Put you two know, and two together. Right. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I didn't go. I ended up going and staying with my mother's youngest sister in Tennessee again. Um, she was living there and, um, I really spiraled at this point into postpartum, into depression. I started drinking a lot and it was really getting dysfunctional and out of control again. And so they sent me back to Costa Rica and they gave me, I did another six months there where I kind of just regrouped and they have a really cool, they had a really cool, like Christian youth group down there with the missionaries and stuff. And so I was a part of that and I had friends and it was great. It was like, cool, you know? So, um, coming back, I came back to Maryland and I was like 19 by now. And at this point I was, I lived with my grandparents for like five seconds before I was like, I can't do this. You know, um, they were very much controlling, like you right under the, you know, Um, and they just wanted the best for me. Right. They, they were just, I mean, if, if I was to look at it when I look at it now, I'm like, okay, what was their positive intent? You know, like. Ultimately they just come from a different time. Yeah. Yeah. Or we develop as humans. I mean, I'm going to be to the point where I'm that age and still in my ways as well. I mean, that's society. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, as a exactly. kid, though. It's hard. Yes, it is. And they just came from a different time, you know, where you did everything according yeah. to societal norms. Like you- also that's a time where my mom still says this today and it drives me nuts because we will never see eye to eye. Kids are meant to be seen, but not heard. Yeah. That's mm. a terrible. Yeah. My mother Social still standard. says that today. Yeah. Yeah. And they believed that they believed yeah. that. And what a, 
And I grew up in that. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's so important. Like a whole generations were, were raised yes. with that. Like kids are it, seen, not heard, not heard. Imagine what that does to your self-worth, your self-esteem as a child, knowing that I am not worthy enough to be heard. Mm -hmm. I'm not my, you, you learn right off the bat that what you want doesn't matter. Your needs aren't, aren't, aren't don't important. matter, yeah. aren't important. Yeah. And so yeah. that's what's translated to me. My needs aren't important. What I want doesn't matter, you know, and so I was living from that place, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy what pro social programming we've been yeah. um, exposed to. It really yeah. is. And then we're like taught, don't question it. Don't question it. You know, yeah. that and I it. always remember, um, don't you dare cry. Cause if you do that, I'm going to give you something to cry something about. To cry about. Yep. You yes. know, it's like, <clears throat> we're, we're telling our kids that it's bad to show some type of an emotion. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I think it's really gotten into society so strong now. That's why I think kids in junior high and even elementary are getting prescribed like Xanax mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're not allowed to show these emotions. Um, I because was, it's talking back. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's different from just me 20 years ago, talking back to my mom. It was like, right across oh, the mouth but cow. it's like to yeah. my kids it's like if you don't explain why you said no like it's going to be a full day thing yeah. like you might as well just explain it you know give them the explanation because a no isn't going to work anymore you know it's like yeah. a no worked then because we weren't heard it's like we yeah. grew up with that just like you said we weren't heard so we didn't have that voice too yeah, yeah. Well, and it, oh. and it's, and it stays with you. Like, you know, I mean, Nick, I know you can get this because, you know, my wife, she was bullied and teased and things like that, and even got into bad relationships. And she basically, her voice didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even when we got married, a lot of times, if there was stuff that was bugging her, she just kept it quiet. And I'm like, I'm the same way, you know, you, you got to get this out. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to, <clears throat> and I learned that because I had a bad anger issue back in my teenage years into my twenties. And it's because when I finally exploded, everything I was holding in, it came out, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like what you said with your mom, with, with that rod, you know, you had finally just had a flip enough and I, yeah, I just think it's, it's bad that society has gotten to where you're not allowed to show any type of feelings, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the man type parts, oh, of yeah. you know, because we, we were always told you do not cry, you mm -hmm. buck it up, you tough it out. You know, we all have our feelings as well. <clears throat> and I was going to a men's group. I won't say which one it was, and we haven't done it for a lot of time, but I, it's the first time that I had actually been in a room with probably 10 guys maybe there was about a dozen of us and we all have a chance to share things and i watched every man including myself in that room break down and start crying mm. and we all brought up that every single one of us was brought up in the way that we are not to show our emotions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. men are supposed to be tough men are supposed to be yeah. and, and protect I, provide and that's why also i think the suicide rate for men is starting to go up is because of that mentality and one mm -hmm. thing one thing that i really admired and it's my daughter and her husband they have taught our three grandkids to have their voice. We, we went to our grandson's soccer game a couple of weeks ago and, or it was our granddaughter's soccer game. And me and the grandson was kicking the ball around anyway, the game was over and it was time to go. And I don't know what upset my, our grandson. And I'm like, buddy, what's wrong? And he just gave me that pouty look, you know, and, and my daughter goes, answer Papa, what's wrong? And he just gave that pouty look like he was going to, you know, whine and he's, and he's five coming up on six. And my daughter said, sweetie, you need to tell us. You have a voice. Tell us. I tell my don't kids, sit and, use your Don't words. sit and pout. Use yeah, use, that's what she says to use your words. And I thought, my gosh, that would have been so cool as a kid to be told that. Use yeah. Your use, your, use your words instead of don't you dare mm -hmm. say what you're thinking, what I'm thinking you're going to say. 
Yeah, and also when, when my daughter's having a hard time, she's sick. She just turned six a couple of week, weekends ago. But for her, it's like she has a hard time with even just getting it out. So I'll tell her, like, if she, if I feel like she needs to cry, I'll tell her it's okay to cry. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes we just need it because it's refreshing and we need to, we need to restart. So we need to get it out. Yeah. It's like, just cry a little bit. And then, you know, you, you might feel better. It's like when it rains, so it cleans the air, like, right? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you, um, learning learning hypnosis is really and I went to a really good school I went to I went for a year um and it it really opened me up to understanding how the mind works and how the mind of a child works even and having teaching a child to have autonomy is probably the biggest thing we should focus on like letting them make their decisions and learn from their natural consequences and not try to prevent them from, from having those, but, but say, okay, as long as it's safe, you know what I mean? You're not going to put your child in a, in a dangerous situation, but. I just recently came across something very similar. They were saying, you don't teach them to not do it. You teach them to do it safely. Yeah. And it allows them that freedom to understand that boundary of, I didn't like that choice or That was a great choice. It was scary, but he did it. Yes. 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 And so they get familiar and they get used to making choices. So when they grow up, they're not like, what do I do? Afraid to make that choice. Yeah. My six-year-old, she can't make decisions. Like you give her three choices and it's going to take her an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like that. It's like, it's so wild and how the mind works. Like. A child from zero to seven years old is in a constant state of hypnosis. They're in an mm-hmm. alpha brainwave state. And zero to three, they're completely not even conscious of them being, you know, a, a person. It's kind of like a puppy. It's so cute. You know what I mean? Um, but everything to a child, when we're born, we're born with just fight, flight, or freeze. We're just born with that primitive mind. <clears throat> so everything to a child is, is life or death. Like if mm-hmm. they don't get the cookie, it's death. That's oh, yeah. why they're crying. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's death to them. And so I can't like trying to think back, like how I was treated, you know, or how, you know, I was disciplined and, and punished for showing emotion like that, for losing it, for um, anything like that, you know, stifle that, push that down. You know I mean? I like, years of just pushing it down and pushing it down and like emotion energy in motion emotion you know it's like a wave right we've got to allow what's a wave do it swells it crests it crashes it dissipates but when we push down an emotion we don't let that wave flow through and so an emotion buried alive never dies it festers, it boils, it, it, and it will bubble back up into the surface years later and manifest itself in physical disease and sickness in the body. It's almost muscle memory at that point. Yes. The body, like there's a great book called the body keeps the score and Mm -hmm. it's, it can be very triggering to read it. So for those of you who have experienced a lot of trauma, be careful if you do read that book, it's quite, um, prolific in some of the things that, you know, that guy came across, um, that he came across seeing his patients that were severely abused. Um, can you say that name one more time? The body yeah. keeps the score, right? The body, the body keeps, keeps the, the score. score. Yes. And why am I blanking? It's a very popular book and I'm blanking on the, um, on the Arthur right now. Hold on. I'll do a quick Google search. <laughs> So Nikki, while while you're doing that Google search, um, if I can kind of go backwards a little bit. Yeah. So you were talking at, um, gosh, the age of fourteen, you you had someone say, "Hey, you wanna you wanna smoke a joint?" And then a couple of weeks after that, it went into the coke and in the crank. With everything that you've explained, how your childhood was, I mean, I just couldn't even imagine living a life so dramatized all the time and just constant movement and being put down and and things like that did did those drugs drugs escalate in you too because i think you said at one time you was drinking a little bit but did they like really escalate 
to, oh, yeah. cause, cause I know a lot of people <laughs> that when they have that childhood trauma, it's not really the alcohol and it's not really the drugs. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's numbing out those feelings that, that you have, yes. what we were just talking about that you're holding within, you're, you're pushing yes. them down as deep as you can go, <laughs> but eventually it's going to work its way back up to the top. Yep. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And yes. I, um, after I had my son, I was in a very abusive relationship. I was not I was smoking weed a little. He didn't uh, drinking a little. He wasn't into all that. So, but he was very much, it wasn't physical abuse. It was mental abuse. It was, I was, I was always too fat. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't tall enough. I wasn't skinny enough. I wasn't, you know, always comparing me to other females and cheating on me and things like that. And so um, I left him finally after four years and then ended up um, single living back home with my mom, who was now with her fifth husband. So my mom, in the meantime, uh, between time of all that happening, um, she met a guy who ended up being, he was in AA as well. So they were doing the recovery thing together and they ended up getting married and she ended up being with him for 25 years until she wow. died. Yeah. Wow. I know. Crazy. Did so, that calm her down? I mean, was he a good, he was a good, provider. A good thing. he was a good guy and he was, um, she, she ran things and he let her, you know, um, he yeah. worked a lot. He worked long hours. So he was not home to witness the things that my mother did in her manipulation and her lies and things like that. But anyway, I was living back home with them. Things were okay. You know, um, and I was partying a lot and I was kind of living with them, but I was also kind of living out of my car and I had this cute little chow chow dog. And I was like, 22 and I'm partying all the time, but I'm also hustling. Like I cleaned houses. I made up flyers on the computer, printed them out, put them out on people's doors and like made myself my own little business, cleaning houses. I would wait tables or whatever I could do for extra cash. I was a lifeguard. So I was always going, 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 work, 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 um, keeping busy, keeping busy, trying to avoid the pain, you know? Yeah. And what had happened was I started dating a guy Again, I'm repeating my mother's patterns of choosing men that were not healthy, that were abusive, that were controlling. And this guy was all of that. And I ended up dating him for just two months before I broke it off because I, I was like, this guy is crazy. I don't want to be, you know, anything to do it. And I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. I left him because I found out he, his wife was pregnant with their fifth child. So I didn't even know, like, as soon as I found out about her, I was just like, no, we're done, you know? And then I found out I was pregnant. <clears throat> so funny, I was like thinking of ways to make money. And um, so I was going to be a surrogate mother. You make like some cash doing this, right? So I was like, this will be my nest egg. I can do it. I can have a baby for somebody. It'll be great, you know? And a family had picked me out and everything. And I ended up pregnant. And so I had to call the lawyer and I was like, I'm so sorry, but I can't do this. I can't, you know, I'm pregnant. And he said, well, I know that you weren't planning on having a baby. So if you'd like to put it up for adoption, you know, you can get this much. So it was still like going to be my nest egg. And I would get this child out away from me, away from my dis sick, dysfunctional family. And I would protect out of the that. cycle. Yeah. I was going to like save this child from being, um, exposed to my family. Uh, and so uh, that was the plan. And then my mother begged me, and I mean, begged me every single day until she broke me down not to give another one of her children up for adoption. And I was like, she was doing better. So I thought, you know, things were better. She was clean and sober. He was, her husband was, they, they, she had had the same job for five years that had never happened. You know what I mean? So things were more stable and stuff like that. And she had really, I think realized a lot of her mistakes with my brother and I. So um, I ended up having her uh, and a daughter and uh, about nine months in, uh, I couldn't do it anymore. I was with another abusive guy. He was um, 
really just, he started having seizures, ended up having a brain tumor. It wasn't safe for her to be home with him while I was at work. So I had to let her go live with my mom and him being put into the hospital and he was never right again. I was like all of a sudden, just all by myself. With a baby. And I, yeah, yes. And so I let her go live with my mom. And I was supposed to get my act together and use that time to get myself together. But what I did was I found heroin and I started numbing the pain with the, that I felt for again, another child. Here I am again, another child. I I'm having postpartum. So I'm feeling all kinds of horrible feelings of low self-worth, self-esteem. I felt I felt like a failure again as a woman, as a mother, you know, and I didn't, I didn't want to be a mom because I did not, I was terrified that I was going to mess another child up like I was, you know, I knew I didn't have the skill set to not be that way. And somewhere deep within me, I knew that I was going to be just like my mother and I couldn't bear the thought of doing that to another child. So in that, I started working in downtown Baltimore at one of the restaurants in the Inner Harbor. And I started dating another guy who was also dysfunctional, who was hooked on heroin and introduced me to that life. And it wasn't long. And I mean, literally within like six months to a year before I was completely strung out. And I turned to a life on the streets. Um, I started to, I left the restaurant job to go dance. at the nude bars and I became an exotic dancer. I started to escort and then eventually ended up just walking the, the block, what they mm. call the block, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and all just to get the fix. And so I wanted to do, like I was doing a lot of speedballing. So I wanted to mix the heroin and the cocaine together. And I got introduced to uh, IV drug use. So I started shooting up. And at that point, like nothing else mattered. No other drug mattered. Nobody mattered. It was just like, I, I probably had like, I think maybe a three or $400 a day habit. So I'd literally turn, turn a trick, go to the dope boy, buy the dope, do the shit. By then I'd have to go turn another trick so I could get more. And it just was this sick, vicious cycle. And my body was breaking down. I was like, paper thin um my piss was brown like I was like dying my kidneys mm. were shutting down and I had track marks and and like really like a just a shell of myself you know and so I pulled myself up out of the gutter there and put myself into this rehab in Philly because I thought you know maybe if I get far enough away I would be able, so I'm up in this rehab. I'm the only white girl in the rehab. So that was, it had its own dynamic. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, again, being picked on and bullied and, and things, you know, uh, a lot of people who had a lot of anger towards white people were taking it out on me because I was the one available to have it taken out on. And of course I am dysfunctional in my behavior as well. So I wasn't helping the problem. I was, I was making it worse. Like I was fueling the fire. So I ended up leaving there and getting with another guy and moving to North Carolina and he ended up being a crackhead. So I had to leave him. So I was like moving, just bouncing, 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 trying to get it together, not getting it together, trying to get together, not getting it together. Finally, um, my mom, when I was in North Carolina, forced me to sign adoption papers so she could adopt my daughter. And she forced me, which by forcing me, I mean, she threatened to take me to court. And if I didn't sign the paper, she would prove me an unfit mother, which I believed at the time that she could have done. Um, And I wasn't in a position to take my daughter anyway. So I went ahead and signed the papers. So that was like another blow. Like I sat in that lawyer's office and I broke down and I just wept and I cried and I cried. And I remember the lady just not, they didn't know what to do. They were just like, what the hell, you know? And I had just broke. Hmm. I had failed at everything, you know? And so she was though the, this, my saving grace, because she was the only thing that kept me from 
from killing myself, even though I tried, I tried to OD, I tried to die. I didn't die. Um, and so uh, clearly I didn't die. <laughs> um, so my mother uh, promised, she promised I'll never keep her from you, but ended up doing that, ended up playing mind games and being very jealous of our relationship because my daughter loved me unconditionally, even though I was absent most of the time and I was on drugs and I was, you know, strung out. She still loved me. And um, my mom, I was, there was periods of time where I was gone for a while. So my mom told her <laughs> that I was her sister and that my mom was her mom. And uh, my stepfather was her dad. So she calls them mom and dad. And to this day, she still calls me Nikki. But when she was five years old, like as soon as she was old enough to understand, I told her the truth. I was like, look, this is what's up, you know? And that pissed my mom off. Um, and so I managed to one more time, like pull myself up out of the, the gutter and clean myself up. And I got accepted into, I was always a good at drawing and art. So I got accepted into this art college in Florida. And so I, you know, worked all summer long and got a car and uh, saved up my money. And I moved down there and I started school in Tampa and I became, was in school for graphic and web design and animation. And so I started this whole new life, you know, again, getting with this guy, another guy who I met out in front of the Salvation Army. He was literally homeless, but I, you know, me being the caretaker and let me fix you person that I, I was, you know, I wanted to help him. And um, we ended up, you know, actually being together for the next seven years. Um, it was one of what I thought was, yeah, I thought was the one, you know, um, he did end up getting himself together and pulling himself up and getting a job. And we did actually pretty good for a little while, but then the drugs started getting worse and I'm in Florida now I'm living in Florida and I was like loving it in Tampa, but we were partying still, you know, um, even though I was like, I had not touched an opiate ever since I had left and come to Florida. I was like, that's the one thing I won't do, you know? Um, and I graduated college. I got a job in the field. Like I was really doing good. And it had been like a few years went by and he started doing the boyfriend started doing a lot of crack and hiding it from me and like doing it behind my back and you know I'd catch him and I'd be like so finally I was like look I you what is going on what the fuck you know because we have a good life why are you doing this and he told me finally that after being together for two years that he was HIV positive and he mm -hmm. did not tell me. And um, we even went and got tested together because I knew I had lived a lifestyle that put me at risk for that, right? Yeah. So I, I kind of come to terms with the fact that if I had gotten something like that, because this is what the 90s, right? Like mm -hmm. it was really like the whole awareness of HIV and what are we doing about HIV and blah, blah, blah. But people were living, they didn't expect people to live this long. The medications were working and stuff like that. So um you know, now this was in the 2000s, but like, you know, I had lived all that time. So I kind of like knew in the back of my mind, I could catch something while I'm out here sharing needles and shooting up and having sex, you know, tricks and shit, you know? So I was like, man, um, let's go get tested. And he lied to me, you know, said he was negative and I was negative. It was crazy. I was negative. I'm still negative. Never got it. I don't know how. Mm. Praise to God. It's amazing. Like it was the craziest situation though, because uh, there was no help for me. They were like, oh, well, you're not positive. So there's no support group for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and I desperately needed someone to talk to about this. I did not know. And then at the same time, my self-esteem was just like nothing. It was zero. And I thought, well, I might as well stay with him because you know, we just started using protection and I was like, I might as well stay with him because he's the only one that's going to love me now, you know, but that whole relationship, um, I became bitter 
and angry and distrustful. Of course, you know, there was a lot of lies. And so there was, I don't, I ended up um, cheating on him with his best friend and like leaving him for that guy. And that guy ended up beating me every other day. Oh, geez. Like this was the first real physically abusive relationship I had been in. He broke my face. There's, you can't see it, but there's a scar right here. Um, broke my face. And that was finally what broke that straw, you know? So after that, I spiraled at it. And this now has been a nine year span, like an eight or nine year span, right? So um, I'm now in my 30s. Okay. And um, I end up leaving that whole situation. And I had stuff on Craigslist for sale, like all my furniture that was in the apartment that we shared. And this guy came and looked at it and he bought it and he was like, Hey, you know, what do you do? And, you know, what are you doing with yourself? And I was trying to be like, Oh yeah, I'm a web designer and blah, blah, blah. He's like, well, I have a studio and I need help with this and blah, blah, blah. And I live out in Arizona. You want to come out to Arizona? So I was like, sure. So I went out to Arizona and, um, I kicked like, again, I had gotten on opiates and started doing heroin and was really bad in Florida. Um, and so I left there, was able to leave there, go to Arizona and start over. And I thought, this is it. I'll start over in Arizona, you know, and it turns out that he was driving large quantities of marijuana from the Mexican border <laughs> Jeez, to Florida. Oh, <laughs> to Florida. <clears throat> and so that is what I began to do. I began to drive large quantities of marijuana across country. Um, so I did trips where I took 200 pounds. I've done trips where I took 50 pounds. Um, and finally, like there was some drama and he got robbed. So we had to like re up with five pounds and then we go flip that and go, you know, I so feel I've been to the border and gotten dope from the cartel, gotten weed from the cartel. And like, this was my life. I was like, wow, how, you know, this is so crazy. How did I get here again? It was so fast, so fast. It was like each mm -hmm. time I went back out, I, um, that much faster was right down at the bottom. I mean, it just really was like, my karma was instant happening now, you know? And so I end up on one of the trips getting pulled over in Texas with 30 pounds and I got caught. And so I, of course, that guy totally disappears off the face of the earth. I don't snitch on him, but I'm just, you know, I don't know enough information either. So I end up getting probation and they send me back to Florida. And so apparently in Texas, this is a normal thing. This is like, this happens a lot. People are get caught trafficking in these small little podunk towns outside of Amarillo, which is where I got caught. And so I got sent back to Florida on probation. And of course, true to form, I meet another guy on the bus who's just gotten out of prison, who's hot and he's all cute and stuff. So that's all that matters to me. And uh, he ends up being abusive and messed up and, and that goes to shit real quick. And so before you know it, I am back out on the street doing heroin, doing, now I'm shooting up crack, I'm shooting up coke, I'm shooting up heroin, like I'm back on all this stuff, and I pissed dirty, and then I got arrested, and which violated me in Texas, and so once I was finished with what I was arrested for in Florida, which was to sale and delivery of heroin to an undercover, and possession of they found they searched my car and found one narcotic pill which was a felony so that was the tip that you know was like oh we're arresting you for this and then all that other stuff came yeah. later so here i am now 37 years old and i'm in jail for the you know it was not wasn't the first time but it was like for the first big thing i think i'd had one other like little stint where i did like a night in jail for some dumb stuff but um, so I end up getting transferred back to Texas. And I tell you what you don't want to do is you don't want to have to be extradited uh, from another state while you're in jail. 
is they shackle you and you have to ride shackled the entire way and it's not a straight shot. They're actually going around and picking up different people from different jails. And um, so that was the craziest, wildest experience too. It was horrible. Don't recommend it. So, <laughs> <clears throat> I don't recommend anything you've been talking about. I know. Right now. Totally oh my, don't do it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, hey, we don't do this. At we're all. gonna take another quick break and then <laughs> we'll come back and um let Nikki wrap this thing up. So guys, stay yeah. with us. We'll be right back. Good morning, this is Leticia with Computer Hospital. We are your computer repair experts for both PC and Mac. We are your community resource for all of your computer repair needs. What makes us different is that we want to fix your computer. We also do free diagnostics. We charge a flat rate labor, which means that you won't pay by the hour. All of our computer repair is done in-house with a fast turnaround time and same day service is also available. Feel free to stop by any time without an appointment. We're located in Sandy at 8721 South State Street. Again, that's 8721 South State Street. Or call us at 801-987-3993. Again, that's 801-987-3993. This is Leticia with Computer Hospital, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hello there, this is Brad Newfeld with the Resilience Talk Network, and I would like to introduce to you Taffy Town, one of our newest sponsors. Let me introduce you to Derek. Hi, I'm Derek from Taffy Town. We're proud sponsors of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Taffy Town is a family owned and operated business still operating in the Salt Lake City area for over 100 years. We manufacture some of America's best saltwater taffy. What makes Taffy Town stand out from all of the others? We have a unique recipe, a whipped style recipe that incorporates egg whites, evaporated milk, real sea salt. It's a unique product that is flavorful, melts in your mouth. And the best part is we probably have a flavor for anyone's um, liking, a flavor for any reason, for any season. Uh, we have unique flavors like chicken and waffles, maple bacon, frosted cupcake, uh, new this year was a pineapple ghost pepper flavor. That's awesome. Where can people find out more about Taffy Town and all of its products? You can check all of this stuff out. All of our products are available uh, for sale on taffytown.com. We ship for free from our website, so all of our pricing on there is, is shipping included. Uh, oftentimes we uh, offer special promotions and discounts to our loyal customers, so do be sure to sign up for an account and we look forward to seeing what we can do to make you smile with our taffy. Where are you located? We are currently located at 9813 South Prosperity Road in West Jordan, Utah, just at the foothills of the Copper Canyon Mine. Derek, taffy has always been a great gift to give. What are some of the creative ways Taffy Town can help say thank you to others? Yeah, if, if you're looking for gift ideas, whether to say thank you to friends or family, or maybe to your clients after such a difficult or successful year that you've had, you could look no further than to get a gift idea from taffytown.com. We offer prepackaged gift boxes that say that it's saltwater taffy from the city of the Great Salt Lake, and it tells a little bit about the history of our community and making candy for so long. You can also do customized gifts to pick out just the right flavors or colors of candy for that special someone and deliver even a personalized message in that box to them. So please feel free to check out taffytown.com for any gift ideas this season. Thank you so much, Derek. Please visit taffytown.com, that's taffytown.com, to find out more about the products and services that Taffytown offers. You won't be disappointed. Do you know someone who's gambling with death due to an addiction? Do you know someone whose life is being turned upside down due to a loved one that's battling with addiction? 
Hi, I'm Al Richards. I am the host of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. I started the podcast due to my wife's battle with alcohol. Let's just say I became addicted to her addiction. Our podcast is helping people understand a little more about those who have battled addiction and those who are hurting from their addiction. Through raw vulnerability, we share stories that help uncover the root causes of addiction. Shame felt on both sides, matter of the conscious and subconscious mind, continued beliefs and often confusing paths of recovery. We collaborate with real people and their stories as well as licensed professionals to help our audience gain a better understanding of addiction. You can find us on Resilience Talk Network. You can also find us on Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. That's Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. You can also find us on YouTube. Just look up the Other Side of Addiction podcast. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the other side of addiction. We are here with our special guest, Nikki Patrick. Again, Nikki, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing this. I don't know if you want to say amazing life, but just. It's amazing. And the fact that it it's not one that you're going to hear again, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing I, that you're still here. Yep. For yes. one, I, I, this whole time you've been talking, I'm like, how in the hell, like, how, how yeah. are you still here through everything that you've gone through without HIV? I mean, yeah, I know that as well. Not getting that, yeah. you know, I hear another one like this beaten to where it kills you. I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, it, it goes to show in life how we, we fall back into the same traps over and over. It's just that life that we're used to. And it seems like that's what we continue to attract, right? Mm-hmm. It's that, yes. it's that same thing. Cause every time you said, okay, you left this guy and then met somebody else. It was like you said, it was, it was that fast that you just kept finding the same type of individuals. And I remember when my wife, when we were dating and she was telling me about her past relationships and things like that, she was doing the exact same thing. She would leave one guy that was verbally abusive. She would land somebody else that was physically abusive. Then she would leave that and go back to someone that was verbally abusive. Mm -hmm. It was just that same, same pattern. You know, ultimately things like this, I mean, not every time, but things like this can be hereditary as well. I mean, same thing when it comes to rape. I mean, there could be a mother and then the daughter and then the granddaughter. I mean, it's a life cycle of what you put out there onto others and how they receive it and how they believe they need to be treated because of that. So Mm -hmm. it's ultimately just repeating a cycle of what you've seen. So that's exactly what you're doing. You're living your mom's life now. Yeah. You're an adult. Yes. I, I'm I'm living the behavior that I was modeled. Yeah, and and that's what it is. It's it's conditioning. It's modeling. It's you know we're born. We have mirror neurons in the brain, so we are to to learn our environment to be mm-hmm. able to survive and adapt. And oh, going back at the very beginning, it was a trauma response. It was yes. the it was a trauma response. The um, being the empath, that in itself being an empath is the trauma response. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I, um, you know, it's all learned behavior. So the good part about that is it can be unlearned. Yes. You know, and so people, you know, I went through um, some more things after, you know, the end of that part of the story. And that it really actually, Um, This time, instead of feeling like I was forced into the adult entertainment business, I willingly like became a dominatrix. I did erotic massage. I was like, this is me. You know what I mean? This is what I'm doing. And I made uh, a metric shit ton of money and in like no time servicing that industry, you know. Um, And it was so sick and dysfunctional. And it was finally I had power over these men. 
I finally, you know, these, these same guys that were nickel and diamond me over their website were the same guys that were paying $300 to take it on their knees like a man. And I was happy to give that, you know what I mean? And it was powerful to me. It was empowering in such a dysfunctional way. Um, so I kind of, even though there was guilt and shame associated with that, like, you know, underneath that all, I was guilty that I was, I felt guilty. I was doing this stuff. I felt ashamed of myself. I felt, you know, it wasn't right. Who was ever going to be one, want to be with the girl in a relationship who does this for a living, you know? And so I was very lonely still, still lonely, you know, without that really deep connection with another human being. And, um, so I ended up going to prison for, I got five years, but I, I did like 13 months. Now in the state of Texas, uh, possession of marijuana under 50 pounds is a third degree felony. So it was like a step above a misdemeanor really. And, um, so I got out, I got let, I got made parole pretty quickly because it's just overpopulated. And so seeing this side of life, being exposed to the prison system, oh my God, you think my story's bad. You know how we're talking about that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Here are some of these. I was like, holy shit. My, my life was a cakewalk compared to some of these stories that I heard from these women in prison. And it really opened my heart up to, and I said to myself, if I ever do anything, I'm going to, I'm going to help people in prison or the people who are getting out of prison, you know, um, because the rate of recidivism is so high. It's like 72 or 80%. And it's because you, you get out and you're a felon. You can't get a job hardly anywhere. So what do you do? Go back you to the same life. Back, yeah. You revert back to that life where you were making that quick money, where you were, you know, and then you're right back in and the cycle is just sick. And there, what's not happening is there's no healing happening on that deep level. We're not addressing the trauma. We're not addressing the, the drugs were just a symptom of the trauma. The drugs were just a way for me to cope with the fact that I had just lived this entire life of trauma, trauma, one after the other, after the other. And a lot of it in, in, in my adult years um, was my, because of the choices I had made. And I didn't have the skill set to make better choices a lot of the time. So these people don't have the knowledge and the skill set and the understanding to make healthy choices for themselves yeah. and we're put into a category now I'm a felon now I'm you know I'm a, a drug addict I'm a felon I'm a this I'm you know what I mean and so uh thank God for the cure for hep C because I was able to get that you know and so this whole like what's amazing what's so beautiful about my story and so many other people's stories who success who have had success is that like literally a fucking lifetime of being beaten up and beaten down. And here I am fucking surviving, you yeah. not only surviving, but thriving with my own office, my own practice, my, you know, ability now to be able to give back what was given to me, you know, is such a miracle. It's such a beautiful story. And I just want to, I want to share this both of my children are in my life today. I met my son three and a half years ago. And he walked down the aisle next to my daughter when I got married to my husband. And it was like the fairy tale ending. He's so good. He's, he's got the best life. And my daughter, even though she had to endure living with my mom, she is married and I'm I have a, a three-year-old granddaughter now and they have her and her husband have a business that's thriving and like the cycle was broken. <laughs> it was stopped. because you allowed it. You allowed that freedom, yeah. that mental space for her. You had that choice to keep her and be selfish and continue down that road, but you didn't allow it. You yeah. let her have another path. I think yeah. this is also Nikki, the reason why you survived everything that you survived. Your purpose was to get to the point where you're at today in your life. So you can help others 
get to that point in their life. Because there's hope, man, there's hope for you to be, you know, for you to be like, not feel like you're crazy and not, you're not crazy. You know, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I was just exposed to a whole lot of trauma. And so you were never a kid. I was never allowed to be a kid. I was never allowed to be myself. I was never allowed to express who Nikki wanted to be, you know? And I'm curious, um, now as an adult, do you tend to watch like cartoons and things like that? Like, all the time. I love Because you're cartoons. making up for it. I, I come across yeah. that recently in a conversation. I was like, oh my gosh, like the Disney adults, like yes. some of them, it's because they didn't have that chance. Right. My husband it, and yeah. I both, yeah, we both are. And so, um, you know, uh, six years ago, uh, I was at a point where I got arrested again while I was on parole and it was for like a misdemeanor and my PO didn't violate misdemeanors, thank God. But I was, there was a second there where I was like, I'm going back to prison. And I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'm done. I don't care what happens from here on out. I will never use again. I will never go back to this life. And no matter what I have to do, I'm going to chase my recovery. Like I chase drugs. I'm going to seek a way, a solution. I'm going to live in the solution. Wow. And you are, you're still doing it. Yeah. It's amazing. It is. And it's like, it's wonderful. And um, you can heal from your trauma and you can live a normal life and you can um, be a functioning member of society. And you can, you can, you know, in the mind, it's so amazing how our bodies and our minds work and, and like just how brilliantly and perfectly we are made because an organism, I adapted. I adapted. I did everything that I was supposed to do based on what I was given. That's what we do. We adapt. And what was adaptive in that situation has now become maladaptive when the situ- that traumatic situation is over. So now it's just a relearning how to live. It's a relearning and, and, and an ad- adaptation um, to living now without having those unhealthy coping skills, replacing them with the coping skills that are serving and are healthy and helping a client like reach that point in their, in, in their life where they're like, okay, I'm not broken. I'm not, um, a piece of shit. I'm not like, I'm not any of those. I am a human being and I deserve love and I am worthy of love and I am worthy of healing. Yeah. It's all just been an error in perception. That's it. It's all just been a lack of love. Nikki, have you found out with a lot of the people that you work with <clears throat> that they didn't realize they had a choice? Yeah. That they're, you know, we we get ourselves stuck on the path like you were stuck on this same path throughout, gosh, all the way up into your 30s. Yeah. You know, 41. I, I was 41 when 41. I got clean. Yeah. So I, I've shared a few times on the podcast that, um, you know, when when I was going to therapy for my anger management, cause I had a really bad temper as a teenage up into my twenties, <clears throat> when the therapist finally did this little exercise with me and made me realize I had a choice. I could either go this way or I could go this way. And I, I just remember kind of scratching my head going, I didn't realize I could go this way Yeah, because you're so used to life and I what only you're thought that I was around. good enough for this. Route. Yeah. Cause well, <laughs> yeah. that's all you knew, yeah. you know, and, and we've had people on our show who grew up in, you know, in California in the gangs, you know, and, and they shared, man, they knew that since they were little, that's mm-hmm. just what they thought life, how it was supposed to be. They had no clue that <clears throat> there was a whole nother life outside of that, a even though they're world. seeing other people. Yeah but they're still not realizing what kind of life these other people have, Mm -hmm. because this is, this is how life's supposed to go. So, I mean, man, girl, I tip my hat off to you. Thank you. (laughs) So many times for everything that you've gone through and to step up to the plate 
you know, and say, I like your comment where you said you finally decided you're going to start chasing recovery like you were chasing the drugs. Yes. That that yeah. whole demeanor, everything, everything did a complete 160. I also you. like the that you said drugs are a symptom of trauma. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And once you can understand that, that's where it's like the freedom from it's like being released from it. You can yes. allow it to let go yes. rather than quitting or, you know, you allow it, you allow the freedom to make it the past because you are advancing past that healing. Yeah, exactly. And, and the reason why it's so hard for people to change, right. Um, is because, in the mind, we get into habit loops. We get the habit, the neural networks are there. It's, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. So the, the bigger this habit is, the harder it's going to be to break that habit. And so anger is a habit. I had that mm -hmm. too. Um, you know, all those, those behaviors, you know, that were uh, once a, a adaptive during your traumatic experience now are maladaptive. So, you know, it's not working out because you're angry at work or you're, you know, taking it out on the kids or you're taking it out on this person and that person. And it becomes a big, huge source of change, um, shame for you. And in order to change, you literally have to rebuild a new neuro network. It's like building a new highway on, yeah. uh, you know, etching it out from gravel to paving it, you know, and really like try and the brain is going to resist. It's called subconscious resistance because it has to burn glucose and resources in order to make this change. The brain has to burn glucose and resources. So it's like, no, I don't want to do that. You know, it's a, it's a, it's to automate these processes and studies show that we spend 95% of our time unconscious in just these loops, these patterns, these habit yeah. loops, you know? Yeah. So breaking those, bringing awareness, awareness is the key. You can't change anything unless you're aware of it. Mm -hmm. And the ego will try to blind you from all of those things and keep you the same because the same is familiar. The same is safe. The same is what we know, even though the same is dysfunctional and it's not good. It's what we know. So the, the subconscious mind is like, let's stick with what we know because over here could be death. The unknown could be death, you know? So it is in hypnosis, helping people in hypnosis um, break that wall down and etch out this new highway of belief, belief systems, these new beliefs, these empowering beliefs that I can do this, that I can be free from drugs and I can process this trauma and let it go. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like magical. I was able to get off two psych meds that I had been on for years, uh, mood stabilizer and an antidepressant with no withdrawal symptoms. I, I, and a year later, and now I didn't even talk about the mental health rigor morale that I went through being misdiagnosed with bipolar and anxiety and ADHD for them to finally be like, Oh, sorry, you had PTSD. <laughs> For real people, wow. if you're on, if you're, if you're on medication for bipolar and anxiety and, and PTSD or I'm not PTSD, but, um, ADHD and stuff, and you have trauma and that medication is not working. It's a good chance that it's because you have PTSD and you've been misdiagnosed with these things. It's a really mm -hmm. good chance because the symptoms mimic each other. Wow. And so and that's, that's where I was. I found myself in this place where it was like, these medicines aren't working. Why, why am I still having mood swings? If I'm on a mood stabilizer, why am I still having these ups, ups and downs? Why am I still having trauma responses? I didn't know they were trauma responses. You know what I mean? Because yeah, I didn't yeah. know what that was at the time, but now I know, oh, I was just in a trauma response. When I was reacting angrily at something is because I was waiting for someone to be angry with me. And that was how I was modeled behavior. Yeah. So it just is amazing what this work can do to help people get over, overcome trauma. And I, I had a gal that I know, Stacy Ford, she's actually been a guest on the show, but she does hypnosis too. And, and um, I went and did a session with her and 
she was telling me a lot of people think with the hypnosis, like they put you out, like you don't know what's going on. And, and really mm -hmm. that's not the case. You, mm -hmm. you are just like in a relaxed state and you're present. Cause I remember when we finished up our session, when, when I kind of came back out of where she was putting me and I, I had tears rolling down my cheeks, Yeah, you know, and, and it was, I was asking her about it and she's like, that's just, I was in deep enough and paying attention what my thoughts were. It was just this stuff that was, it was coming out. It was, I was just releasing it. And again, that's why we were saying earlier, it's okay to show emotions, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. that, that is a way of releasing, releasing whatever is holding inside of you. And I like to use the duck analogy where if you're sitting at a park or somewhere and you're watching a duck swimming around in the pond and you see this other duck come in and attack that duck and it, rah, 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 and it takes off. If you watch that duck that got attacked, it'll fly a little ways, land back in the water and it'll stand up and it'll flap its wings and quack a little bit. And then it just goes around swimming like nothing happened. You know, so it's like it was releasing everything that had just happened. And now it's like, OK, it's gone. I'll just forget just, about it and uh, I'll just go on. <laughs> and I remember also reading that in a book, you know, where someone was saying that. But for us as humans, we seem to hang on to it. Yeah. And like you said, we we allow that stuff to continuously go in that circle. And, um, that's, that's some of the mistake that we made. Cause we had, we had, um, Kobe Bronson who works for matter behavioral. I was doing a podcast with him and he said, your subconscious mind does not know what's real and what's not real. So if you're telling yourself that life sucks, yep. I'm worth, I'm not mm -hmm. worth anything. That's exactly what's going to continue to mm -hmm. go forth. But if you say, okay, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, as you've probably all have heard that said, you know, and yeah. you, you start paying attention to what your mind is telling you. There's a good book called uh, The Conscious Creator. And that book really also helps explain that um, if you start paying attention to what your thoughts are telling you, you can start unplugging those neurons and replugging them somewhere else to start going, Hey, wait a minute. No, I'm not this person. I'm this person. And mm -hmm. it doesn't happen overnight because it took time to get you to that point. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't happen overnight, but as you continue to work on it, pretty soon those thoughts are less and yep. less and less. And the subconscious mind has a way of still unburying things mm -hmm. and shuffling okay. right back into the front of the lobes again. But when you're paying attention, what's being said I believe it all comes back, back or comes down to just the energy. Um, take a house plant, for example, you can mentally be negative towards that plant, not verbally, but that plant can still pick up on that negativity mm -hmm. and will grow that way. So it's that positive and negative that we're feeding ourselves that, I mean, everything you're saying, it's like, what goes through my head as well as like, I've had some of these struggles just mentally when it comes to coming from a place of needing the Christmas mother to owning my own business. I mean, there's that mental struggle of, am I really worth it? I, am I an imposter? Like mm -hmm. all of yeah. that, it's, oh, it's yeah. that mental struggle and that negativity. It's, it comes down to the energy. What energy you put behind it is going to be the outcome, whether that's going to be a negative or positive energy. It really just comes down to the words that you're telling yourself. Mm -hmm. And that really is derived from your life experiences. There's, exactly. there's a lot of words that I have worked on getting rid of in my vocabulary. Yes. Good is one that I'm working on, but is one that I'm working on because can't, <laughs> can't, um, one that I have really, really worked hard on the past um, 10 years is try. Try. Oh yeah. Yeah. Try. Cause try. And, and of course the word hate is completely yes. pretty much out of, cause even if you say, Oh, I hate these pants, that's emitting something very negative, yep. but people don't realize it. You know, and if, mm -hmm. if you watch TV or even in commercials, I heard it in a commercial just the other day, you know, where the word hate was, and it was just, I can't remember what it was about. And I'm, I picked up on it that quick because it's something that I'm working on 
you know, even the should, I, I said should yesterday, I was t- talking to somebody and I said, you should, and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, scratch that. And I was thinking, okay, how can I, how can I still say this without saying that, that word? And I was in a class where the teacher was saying, you, sh- you do not should on people. Mm-hmm. No. You know, and, and when I said, don't shit all over yourself either. and don't shit all yeah. over yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. man, this has been some really good stuff. What, what did you think of the show, Nikki? Oh. This is like your first one that you or not Nikki, but uh, my Mel, sister's sorry. name is Nikki. Yeah. Her it's sister's okay. name is Nikki too. But uh, yeah. What did you think of, of this? Oh, like I'll be back next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could go over stuff. Like, I feel like this is honestly my true down deep in my core passion because it's, it's life. It's yeah. everyday shit that yeah. somebody yeah. else needs to hear this. And they're going to be like, ding. Oh my gosh. Like that's the piece that I have been missing that I needed. That's going to help me get, get to where you there. need to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to yep. um, really quick, just say, because you said at the beginning, you wanted to circle back around to sound and yes, frequency. the yes. sound frequency. Yeah. Yes. Cause that's um, big. Cause I did I buy a it. CD once um, um oh my gosh i'm trying to remember the gal's name i met her and her and her husband do that and it's because it didn't dawn on me until you mentioned it when i brought it up to nikki i want to know a little bit more about that but it's the brainwave entrainment entrainment yes. right yeah so there's yeah. entrainment so there's certain certain tones that mm-hmm. help kind to if i'm now i may be mistaken here correct me but it kind of aligns everything back where it needs to be. Is that correct? Yeah. And it takes, it takes repetition. So the more you listen to that, um, and also it, anything that you listen to uh, 30 minutes before bed will be the first thing integrated into the subconscious mind when you go to sleep. So it's always good to do your affirmations or listen to something like that uh, before bed, um, because you begin to naturally go into a state of hypnosis at that time. So you become suggestible. So whatever, like I like to do my, um, I like to do a technique called future pacing my journal, where I will write in my journal as if I'm writing about the day. And then I begin to write all the things that like the things that I want to manifest as if they've already happened. And oh my God, I'm so grateful for, you know, this and this, and I got to tell you, I did this in the beginning of the year, I was setting goals and I I sat down and I began to write, like I set all my goals, right? I was going to do this by this time, this by this time. And I was like, how did you get there? So I began to write and I began to write real stuff and then stuff that was imagined. Okay. Like, like I just made it up like, okay. And I was, and it's so funny because I put, I was on uh, Facebook lives and three podcasts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I am been on Facebook lives and this is my third podcast. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah, that is, is the awesome. wildest thing. And this, the writing is a direct link to the subconscious. But when you were talking about right, the words, the power of the words, right? Thoughts become things. They have a frequency. Everything has a frequency that can be calibrated. And so when you have a sound instrument, I use a lot of tuning forks. I do have crystal bowls, but in the tuning fork therapy that I use, those are those tuning forks are um, made to a specific frequency and that frequency is resonant. And so in our bodies and throughout our lives, because of the thoughts, because of the experiences that we have, we get dissonance, we get out of tune basically. And when the body hears the resonance in the tuning fork, it says, oh, that's right, that's where I need to be. And it auto corrects itself to bring itself to that that resonant frequency into balance. And so, also in the work that I do is called biofield tuning is the specific name for what I do. And that is a technique uh, or energy medicine that when, so in our lives, we leave bits of us behind um, and it gets trapped in our biofield. Our biofield is our aura. And when we have a traumatic event or just life or whatever, even an orgasm, we leave bits of us behind, right? And it gets Mm. trapped in that moment in the biofield. So let's say we have an unprocessed emotion of fear from when we were four and, you know, we, something happened, right? And we were fear, we were really scared. That got trapped there because most likely you didn't get a chance to process that. 
So what I do is with a tuning fork, when you activate a tuning fork, it becomes magnetic. And that light energy that was leaked out of your energy centers, your chakras at the time, picks up that light energy and I drag it through, it's called field combing back to the, to the body. And I put it back into the body. And so I'm bringing resonance to that dissonance, to that dense uh, energy that is stuck there. I'm breaking it up and then bringing it back to the body and dropping it into the energy center where the imbalance came from. And so people feel more put together, lighter. Um, there is a, there's a slight chance of a physical detox from this work um, because it, it's really wild. I've never, it's by far the neatest thing that I do, the biofield tuning. And um, I've seen profound changes in myself and in my clients just from like one to three sessions, really, um, which whole like things shift for them and they feel better and they're seeing things from a more positive perspective because we were able to go back in time to that moment. And I, I know because I've marked the floor, like six feet out is birth and gestation and it's a timeline into the body to now. And I know how old, so I'm like, oh, I'm really stuck here at age four. What happened, you know? Or you don't have to tell me if it's too much, just let's honor that. Let's, let's hold space for that time and work through that. And then I sit there with the tuning fork until I hear the resonant sound. And so based on the, the pitches in the fork, the sounds in the fork, the overtones and undertones, I can tell if it's fear, anxiety, uh, worry, alarm, whatever it is, I can pick that up in the sound. So it's not like I'm oh. doing any magic. I'm just listening to the sound of the fork and the sound of the fork reflects back to me um, what was going on. And so it's like you have that fork and you activate it, it becomes magnetic. It's like taking a magnet and dragging the metal filings. You remember those games? Yeah, when you were kids? yeah yep. it's just like that. I'm dragging um, the light energy back to the body and kind of putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. So I love it's it. very cool. That's beautiful. It, it really is. It really is cool stuff. Um, yeah, I think even, you know, the reggae, the, the hypnotherapy, any of that stuff, the healing, um, I went to a Tibetan bowl thing years ago and yeah, uh, cool. they asked me to get up and they put the bowl over my head and they did the little thing. And, and I've done it, I think three times. And what's weird is every time it happens to me, I start smelling incense every single freaking time. Huh. And what's weird is I've been close to when they've done it to other people close enough to where if I could smell incense, I'd smell incense if it was happened to them, but it didn't happen to them. But every time I had the bowl over my head and they did the thing, I That's could smell wild. incense. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there in the world, guys, that, uh, that can help you. Nikki, is, is there something that you would like to leave with our listeners? Yeah, that um, change is possible. Recovery works and is possible. And all it is, is a choice. It's you realizing that you have a choice to either live in the problem or live in the solution and being willing, you know, and they say in the, in the, in the readings, in the rooms, you know, the three of these pr spiritual principles that are indispensable are honesty, open-mindedness and willingness with these, we are well on our way. And so basing our walk with those spiritual principles and saying, I'm willing to try whatever it takes. I'm open-minded enough to try those things that seem crazy in order to stay clean. I'm willing to do that. And I'm honest enough with myself to know that I need help. I can't deny it anymore. And, and it's there. You'll, you'll find it. The I universe will reflect back to you what you put out. And so when you make that when you set your intention, your intention is your magic power. When you set your intention to do something, you do it. So set your intention to heal and the universe will provide the path. Yeah. Hey, Amen. And you're a living example of it. I am living right proof. Now. If anybody living can proof. get clean, yep. I, <laughs> yep. if, if I can get clean, <laughs> anybody can get clean. Yep. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, gosh, Nikki, again, thank you so much for your time. I, I am again, so, so grateful to Anna for connecting us. Yes. And, um, this was just an incredible show. 
And Mal, Mal, thank you for, for being here with us today and being me. a part of yeah. this. You know, I got so. more out of today than I really thought I, I would. Yeah. This is, this is why I call uh-huh. Thursdays. Like my, it's my, it's my therapy sessions oh, because it, it really helps me a lot as well. And, and helps with my wife, you know, when she's struggling with her addiction stuff, but um yeah, again, thank you. And uh, a thanks to Resilience Talk Network again, Brad, and to all our other sponsors out there, because we do have a plethora of sponsors that are out there supporting us. And um, again, Matter Behavioral, thank you. Again, if you guys are looking for a different type of recovery center, give them a call at 435-462-2781. Um, Gosh, I guess that's it, man. This was a long show, but it was worth every single flipping minute of it. So guys, we're going to leave you with this as we do at the end of every show. Remember, addiction is giving up everything for one thing. Recovery is giving up one thing for everything. We're out.